Right, Matthew, I'm interested. I, I heard an interview with you where you said that it was good to get three good opinions on an event. Now, does three good opinions make a syndicate? Possibly. I think it'd be, I think it's a very nice starting place. Um, but uh, I mean the well quite often at least two opinions I think is a good starting point um, Matthew Benham and Tony Bloom together once upon a time um, Bill Bentler and um, oh, brain's gone Alan Woods um, but yeah you know quite often having um, two two people who come with different perspectives absolutely I think um, is a good starting point to coming up with something that will, will have real value. The third, the third is one of those things where I think you don't necessarily need three if the first two have got different opinions on how to do things. I think that's the real, real value. You know, I, if I'm horse racing, you know, it's like, can I have someone who handicaps by weight and someone who does speeds and sectionals? Right, when you, when you combine, we've got a nice overview of everything kind of thing. Um, whereas if you've got two people who are very good at the same discipline, combining them together gets you extra value by combining them, but even better. But the reality is, is that the third opinion can always be the market. So what you can do is, and, and Bill Bentner is well known for this, is that he incorporated the pool money as it was updating in the Hong Kong pools into his... So he always had a second opinion in the sense that he had the humility to know my price is the best when it's combined with the market information. So, but I think three, you know, if you've got two people who've got a good idea and they're willing to use the market as the third guide, yeah, that, that definitely gets you to a point where you can start to do some smart things, I'd say. Okay, now I'm interested in the, in the sports betting market compared to horse racing. That, I assume that everybody in sport, well, you'd hope that everybody in sports betting is trying. So certain moves for a certain competitors would be based on maths and algorithms and things like that. How does that compare to the real insider knowledge that could outweigh all the maths and the experts in horse racing? You'd have to take a different view on different, you know. And so I think, I think a lot of people sort of try to do like a completely different approach to accommodate that. And I think the reality is, is that if there's any doubts, you know, if it's group one race, you know, good as gold, everyone trying, you know, it's that it's approach A and you've got higher limits, higher confidence kind of thing. And if it's a race where, you know, you maybe feel that some of the trainers, you know, got more of a gambling yard kind of thing, or you maybe have some doubts over certain elements or whatever, trying or not trying. I think a lot of people say like, well, let's build something that can accommodate that information or somehow let's let's sort of track how that trainer performs with runners who've not run for this many days for da, 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 da. and it's like probably is a good way to do that and i'm sure smart people have got close to it but to me it's just a case of if you know if i'm a bookmaker it's like well i'm laying to lose a grand in that race and i'll lay to lose <laughs> 20 in the other race so for me it's kind of you know you you lay smaller bets and you move quicker and if you find that and, and the thing is is i think um you know it the friendless horse is, I think people are kind of hesitant because in a book, it's not, if you've got laid no bets on a horse, like the second favorite, you're there thinking to yourself, oh, that'd be a nice result. And then suddenly, at some point it's got a dawn on you, no one's come for this horse whatsoever. And you're suddenly thinking, yeah, I better find out where they will come for it. 72 to fours, nope, 92, nope. Oh, and then that's, and that's where you get this sort of cascade where suddenly everyone's realizing, no one will bet this thing at any price and that's terrifying and then that but i think i think people are slow to do that discovery of where's the money going to come in because they just think it's so nice to have that book where you're like oh so these three horses we clean up you know you know that's all right and this one's terrible and that one's okay kind of thing like you, you sort of it's very easy to think to yourself oh but making job done the reality is, is that if ever you haven't taken any bets on anything, sort of especially near the front of the market, I'm starting to wonder, yeah, what, what, what's the real price of this? This sort of just, because, but make it, you know, the money is distributed across, you know, you're not seeing every bet in the world. Um, uh, but the reality is, is that all of you may be sat there thinking, yeah, no one's come for this. And 
Right, your price, must, a, price must be right. I want your opinion on this question. How much data would you need to analyse before you could come to a solid conclusion about whether a punter was any good? I'd say it has grown more and more by the year that I'm in the industry. So I would have, I would have happily said, that, you know, 20-year-old me would literally be like, 100 bets in, guy's killing us. We need to really, you know, really get aggressive when he comes on. I'm, I've got to be moving, you know, moving aggressively, all the rest of it. Um, and then it sort of has crept up and up. And then I sort of, particularly looking at things like Joseph Bookdahl's work, football data, he, um, he does a lot of analysis of like sample sizes to prove that your record is not just the product of luck. How likely is it that it's because of skill? And you start plugging, he's got a spreadsheet and just plug in numbers into that and you're thinking, you know, what, you know how, how many bets, how, what sort of probability would I need them to be not luck before I sort of would take it seriously? You think, well, you know, if there's a one in five chance that, that you know, it's luck, you know, okay, well, that, that's probably starting to look smart. One in 10, one in 100. But the funny thing is I've, I've, I've got to the point now where I've started to see some betting records which are in the tens of thousands and you can take huge chunks out of these betting records and it's like that statistically measured that as a betting record is actually got a crystal ball. This section, take this chunk out, is a mug, we'll give them, you know, we'll, we'll invite them to the FA Cup final. And so when you get big enough sample sizes it's it's sort of amazing how hard you it's fun it's really healthy in a way as, as a bookmaker because these sample sizes get so big that you're like you soon start to realize you really can have a crack you can give these people a run the problem and i'm sure people will be like like saying like oh so why am i closed after one bet or whatever inevitably there are certain strategies which are bad value for the bookmaker forever i don't need to see ten thousand bets of someone you know backing bad each way horses in. and people will tell me like oh well eight runner handicap short price favorite you know why don't you just uh you know some people actually said to me like why don't you just price those races better it's like you know or why don't you just offer different each way terms it's like well i can't if my neighbor is not offering different each way terms like online we're talking you know if bet 365 or labrook's not offering different each way terms i've got to go with that and if i go up on odds checker and i'm just like worst price every horse what does that look like so eventually you come to the point where like, well, I've got to lose a bit on those types of races for the benefit of the broader product. But then if I've got a customer who only bets that kind of race, where I'm sort of locked in by those each way terms that sort of are the bedrock of you know, the UK horse racing industry, um, I, don't I don't need to, to take your record out. But I would say, yeah, I, in general, my opinion has just, you know, we've gone from hundreds to 500 to thousands to ten, and the bigger the odds, the more chance that you can have this wild hot streak. You know, I mean, the reality is, is that there's some people who bet on golf. If you're betting 50 to ones each week, if you hit three winners on the bounce early on in the account, you could be a poor as a church mouse come three years time. But you, it, it can be a bit startling. You're like, oh God, is this one well, three winners on the back, on back to back, you know, in golf, like, what's he known? You ask yourself, what do you think he knows? You can't know that suddenly someone's, you know, <laughs> each week someone suddenly found the myth, you know, found the mystical way to beat golf kind of thing. It's kind of, it's just, that is just variance. Well, one, one thing, I mean, I've been lucky enough to speak to a lot of professional punters and nearly all of them have said that keeping their edge is the, is the most difficult thing. Their edges come and their edges go and finding another edge is the tricky thing of staying ahead of the game. So is it not worth bookmakers, like you sort of said, really giving people enough rope to, so they don't realise their edges run out until it's too late? I, I think so, although yes, I absolutely think that. However, coming back to what I said about optimally monetizing that information, for the time that they have an edge, you've got to make sure you're not getting killed. And you've got to make sure that overall your books stay profitable. So there's a situation whereby this person could fall off a cliff at some point, but for the moment, I've got to move aggressively, reshape the book each time they bet. And the funny thing is, is that you can get to this point where someone, you don't realize it, and they don't realize it, but their edge is gone. And there'll be a while where you're moving aggressively off them and you really shouldn't be. If you knew, if you could reach the future, you'd know, well, this person's gone at the game. 
And so, in that period of time, that you'll be aggressively moving, pushing things out, and you create the next man's edge at this point, because he's like, oh, they, these horses are always massively too big, you know, the price is on them, you know, this type of horse, whatever, and it's because clearly someone else bets this other kind of horse. Um, but that is, you know, t to what extent is any of this done now? You know, not so much, you know, like, you know, it's very rare. Um, but, you know, it's, it's um, I, I definitely believe that, you know, give people as long a period as you can. And even if after, you know, 100,000 bets, they turn out to be geniuses. Well, if I ever find someone who I can absolutely bank on to have the right view, then that's obviously worth something. Okay, and I'm interested that you were, we're moving quickly on to the betting exchanges. Now, I've seen you describe them in the early days as the Wild West. Now, what do you mean by that? It's very hard for me to confirm a lot of these stories because I've not met the individuals involved um, necessarily. But like the stories of, from what I understand, there was one or two individuals who tried to price every race for Betfair. Every single race. People, and these were not people who'd like, as far as I understand, these were not people who'd been like lifelong on-course bookmakers. These were, or something similar. These were people who decided that they could do this. And again, I've never had anyone from Betfair confirm this, but the story goes that some of these people were bankrolled. You know, they were staked to provide liquidity and so on, which I think is perfectly sensible, you know, when you're trying to get the exchange off the ground. Um, so you had people like this. Um, you had the early people who just thought that you could lay, you know, any big price and it was just free money. And there were, you know, disjointed markets where you'd have like, no one was betting very strong models in things like horse racing, just like the place versus the win market. You know, you'd quite often be like, hang on, this horse is like odds on to place, but it's like 20 to one in the win. Like, well, you know, someone's just not done the joined up thinking here kind of thing. And, or someone's got a very strong opinion about the place, but no opinion about, the, you know. So it was, everything was very disjointed, whereas everything now moves fairly smoothly. As soon as something's gone in one market, it changes in another. And there's less complete cavalier, you know, like behavior in terms of just like suddenly putting up massive blocks of money. Like, um, you know, sometimes you just see like, oh, someone would like to have 50,000 on this horse at 9 a.m. at even money. And you're like, well, that's a fairly strong indicator that someone wants to back it. You know, you just be kind of like, right, okay. So you, you, well, it was a bit all over the place back then. Um, and a lot, lots more people used to just leave it. Like, so be like, oh, okay. So what I do is I just, in the morning, log on. I want to back this horse at this price. I'll just put up a massive lump of money and go to lunch or whatever. And now everyone, you know, is either got a robot algorithmically trading it or if you want if you're a pro punter you're there like you know trying to feed it in or you're trying to move it around but you know no one's there's a lot less casual cavalier behavior i would say um for certain um is that lack of mug money for one of a better word meant that there's less for the shrewdies to hoover up now so they sort of started looking elsewhere i think the idea of the large exchange whale who's going to be a big long-term loser, I feel like that definitely feels rare. The idea that there's guys who, I think, sadly, the, you know, the mug's always a, a tough word. The people who are going to struggle to make it pay often fall into the trader category. We, we can go online anywhere now. We can find thousands of e-books and courses and so on about how to trade on Betfair, you know, make a tick here or there, this kind of stuff. And it's undoubtedly doable. There's undoubtedly people who've made fortunes doing it. But I think the number of people, you know, we actually see succeed at this is uh, it's a tiny fraction. And you know, what the internet shows you is not the, not the reality. And I think a lot of those people give it a go and they get eaten up. So I think they're sort of the, the fish for the sharks as it exists right now.